afternoon. On behalf of Thomson Reuters Institute and ILTA, the International Legal Technology Association, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Dauntless Ascent, Adapting to Accelerating Technology Change in a Global Pandemic. I'm pleased to welcome our speakers. Our panel will be moderated by Joe Rosinski, a technologist and futurist and manager of technical client management at Thomson Reuters. And our panel includes Cheryl Wilson Griffin, Chief Customer Success Officer at Lupul, Colin Levy, a legal technology thinker, speaker, and writer, Daniel Linna, Director of Law and Technology Initiatives and Senior Lecturer at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and McCormick School of Engineering. Thank you for viewing and listening to the program. I'll now turn things over to Joe. Thank you, Alec. Really looking forward to this. So welcome one and all to the Thomson Reuters and ILTA, of course, panel on the Dauntless Ascent, adapting to accelerating technology change in a global pandemic. We, of course, thank our partner, ILTA, for their involvement in this. And we hope that you all are safe and healthy right now. As Alec mentioned, I am Joe Rosinski, a technologist at Thomson Reuters. We are very happy that you're here today and excited to have this conversation. So as I mentioned, what we're really gonna get into is sort of the pace of technological advancement and innovation across all industries and market sectors, which clearly have no sign of slowing at this point in time. So consequently, it is vital that all companies, no matter what size you are, what type of organization you are, are staying ahead of this curve. Um, all these new technology innovations that are taking place are directly or indirectly having an impact on all of us. And so before we begin and before we get to the panel, one of the things I like to do, and I apologize in advance, is try to, to create a, a a time of what is really happening right now, because it is clearly an amazing period of time, unlike any time in all of human history, where there's immense opportunity, but there's a lot of challenges out there. We see that within the last year, of course, because of the pandemic, but also other things. And because I'm a technologist, I always thrust upon everyone, and with apologies, um, that technology sometimes has the best possible uh, answers for us sometimes, right? So there's a lot of things involved in that. So to help crystallize all of this, I'm gonna throw out a few ideas. So five quick face melting thoughts that I want to propose to you, uh, the audience, but also to our panelists as they start to conceptualize some of the things that we're gonna talk about. The first, the first face melting thought of the day is Apple is scheduled to release Apple Glass. They, I don't know why they chose that title, but Apple Glass, which is reminiscent of Google Glass, which is mixed reality eyewear that's going to happen within the next 18 months. So imagine we've all been on these WebExes or Zoom meetings or all these other ones, right? The team meetings. And we've been on these, these experiences where we can see people now, which is great, or interacting, which is wonderful. But imagine donning these things and being able to see each other's avatar that are getting more and more realistic and communicating that way. So we're all at this table, we're gathered together, we can communicate, dive into data much easier. That's coming in the next 18 months. What impact will that have on us in the practice of law, the business of law, all these things? The next thing that I love, it's near and dear to my heart, is DeFi. What is DeFi? Decentralized finance. So believe it or not, you can do it now if you really want to be on the sort of the <laughs> cutting edge of this. You can go bankless, which means all loans, liquidity, interest, currency, all of those things are available to you now without having to use a bank. Fairly un unregulated, fairly uh, a nascent area, but it's something that to keep an eye on. The third of these face melting items is somewhat related. There are now 83 nations around the world of the 197, I believe, we're up to 197 countries, um, are building or about to build their own digital currency, what are called central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Also amazing to think about. Another area of growth, and this is a fascinating one because as we talk about it, if we talk about it, it pivots into this idea of smart contracts. So you may have heard of the NFT, so the non-fungible token. These are bits of art that are sold online, unique pieces that are stored on a blockchain, whatever the case is. But this is the first entree into the consumer market of, of the smart contract, of being able to say this digital representation of something can be proved 
And you can then uh, create parameters around that. If it sells, if it goes somewhere, all of these types of things can be built into contracts uh, that lawyers, that attorneys will have to deal with going forward. The fifth, the fifth of, of these is gonna lean in the direction, of course, of AI. So Elon Musk, uh, love him or hate him, uh, he has many different businesses that are out there, right? And one of which is called, and it's not talked about too much unless you're really in the industry playing around with it, uh, GPT-3. So it is essentially AI that's revolving around tons of data. I mean, we're talking about immense, immense amount of data they have access to that people are now able to build out onto. So GPT-3 moving to four, so three version three, we're moving to four pretty soon, allows people to do almost anything you can conceive of to start to play around with it. One way, back in, back in the day, I used to do a lot of web development. And so for me, it related that I... I would be able to interact with the computer and basically speak into a microphone like this and say, okay, I want to build a website. And on this website, I want a uh, image of my uh, logo in the upper left-hand corner. I want um, a page to be dedicated to all of my clients that I've worked with. And you literally speak to it and it develops it real time. Whereas normally you'd need some, some programmer to do it or you need an interface to work with that. These are all of the advancements. So those are your five quick face-melting thoughts of the day as we get into this. Now, that's the setup. Let's sort of talk about what the next stages are. I would love to introduce our esteemed panel. And so would each of you mind introducing yourselves? Uh, maybe your organization would like, we sort of talked about that, but also a little bit of context for what we're going to talk about today, uh, where you sit in the organization, what your philosophies are, things like that. Maybe Cheryl first, then Colin, and then, of course, Dan. And Cheryl, you might be on mute. Is this the perfect time to use my you're on mute sign? Um, <laughs> so sorry, I'm Cheryl Wilson Griffin. I am the Chief Customer Success Officer at a legal tech startup called Lupal. Um, and my background is um, largely big law. So I've been through three of the largest firms here in the US. And I've really focused over the last 20 years on working closely with lawyers to leverage technology, implement business process within firms that in the end improves um, the quality of legal service delivery. And so that's really where the, my focus has been. Um, in terms of kind of where I kind of fit in this spectrum, I'm very, um, very committed and passionate about how we improve the practice of law by using technology. Um, and so I think that's an area that we haven't quite nailed yet. The law schools haven't quite nailed yet. Hopefully Dan will help us. Um, but that's, that's where I'm passionate today. And so that's where a lot of my focus is. No pressure, Dan. All right, Colin, <laughs> you're next. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so my background is uh, as a lawyer, but as an in-house lawyer, having worked in a number of different uh, companies and sizes of law departments. Uh, and, you know, my views, I think, are derived from the fact that prior to law school, I worked for a big law firm in New York as a IT paralegal creating e-discovery databases. And um, I didn't really expect, but secretly was hoping that there would be some mention of technology. There was none. Uh, so when I graduated from law school, um, I really took it upon myself, recognizing the fact that technology was continuing to advance and wasn't waiting for anything or anyone to catch up to it, uh, to really try to stay up to speed and adapt to um, the changing needs of business as uh, supplemented, I would say, by technology, uh, anticipating kind of future client needs. And that has informed, I would say, how I have uh, served as a lawyer and also as, I would say, a educator and advocate for legal technology and trying to make it less uh, scary and more accessible for people um, who might fear, you know, robots coming down the road trying to take something away from them or their job away from them or something along those lines. Excellent. Thank you. Dan. 
Yes, thanks, Joe. Glad to join you, and, and really glad to join Cheryl and Colin for this uh, discussion. So, I'm I was formerly an equity partner at Honigman, a large law firm, where I was a litigator. Uh, I did supply chain litigation and also some privacy, security, social, and emerging media work. Before I went to law school, I was an IT manager and a developer. I uh, developed enterprise-wide information systems. So that kind of technology background before I went to law school has really shaped the way I practice. And now what I do uh, as, as a member of the faculty at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and also in the McCormick School of Engineering in the Computer Science Department. And I'm the director of Law and Technology Initiatives. We, we In addition to being a senior lecturer, we teach uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary classes and do interdisciplinary research, a lot of it with computer scientists and law students, our innovation lab, for example. We have law students working side by side with computer science students. We work on projects with external uh, law firms, legal departments, legal aid organizations. We work with the judiciary. Matter of fact, we did a project last year with the Dominican Republic judiciary. And I think one of the things that's so exciting to me is really just thinking about what is law, what is the rule of law, what do legal services look like in a digital world? Because we've got an access to justice crisis. We should be thinking very carefully about that. How do we expand access to law and understanding of rights and responsibilities to everyone? I mean, when people are walking around with supercomputers in their pockets, why don't they have access to this information and uh, information that can help them prevent and solve problems? Uh, so that, that's, that's something that's really exciting to me. And then, of course, large companies are struggling with dealing with globalization and, and how do they comply with laws, not just here in the U.S., but around the globe. And we can use technology and a people process data technology approach to make things better for them and, and um, at the same time, then make better things better for everyone in society. So those are the things that really drive me in the work that I do. Fantastic. No, thank you so much. You all are the, the tri triumvirate of uh, thought leadership here. I'm <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this very much. All right. Now, let's sort of um, narrow the focus about what we're going to be talking about today. So there are five distinct topics that we'll work through. The first is organizational challenges of accelerating change. The second is managing change fatigue and user adoption challenges. The third is maintaining business continuity and disaster recovery for cloud and SaaS. Uh, fourth is evaluating the efficacy of value and new emerging technologies that are coming out that we probably touched on a little bit already. And then, of course, lastly is, okay, let's round this all together to testing and managing these integrated systems. Now, there might be some ebbing and flowing of all of this. It should be a fluid conversation that we're all looking forward to. So let us, let's start off with, I guess, the organizational challenges. And Colin, from your perspective, uh, having practiced being in a startup, I know you do some blogging, what are you seeing organizational challenges of accelerating towards change impact in the industry? What are you seeing in that space? What does it look like from, from your view? I mean, I can only speak from my um, experience, but I'd say that one of, the, one of the big things I've seen is not necessarily I would say a lack of desire to change and adapt, but more a, a a sort of uncertainness and uncertainty surrounding how best to go about doing that and in making it less painful for the company and for the culture. Because I think a big impediment oftentimes to change and adaptation is um, complacency and a comfort level with how things exist right now and fearing that if you enact some sort of change, it's going to be uncomfortable and more importantly than being simply being uncomfortable, it's going to impact the ability of the business to continue to succeed and thrive. And there's, I think, some tension there that often needs to get, um, get resolved. I would say also that there is, you know, certainly a growing recognition, I think, of companies and of the part of law departments of the role of technology, but kind of a little bit of uncertainty about how, where best to turn to tech, what tech would make most sense for them, and also how best to make it work with your existing kind of tech stack and, and, and how that works. And so oftentimes that can also often lead to um, a delay or a desire not necessarily to move as fast as, as otherwise would seem to be necessary. And so there are these struggles, I think, that remain in place that um, are slowly being addressed by the market. But those are some of the things that I've been seeing from my experience. 
No, great perspective. So along that theme of trying to, to figure out where this starts, Cheryl, where do you look at, when you look at this type of thing, where do you see it as the beginning for this? I mean, do we, when we're starting at the firm, are there certain groups of people that we interact with to try to figure out these types of operational challenges? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a tendency to start with whomever starts talking the loudest. Uh, in many cases, that's going to be the senior partners, right? They have the floor most of the time. In other cases, it's the very junior people who just got in from law school and have this technology that maybe they've been using at law school. But I think where we really need to start focusing our efforts is in that nice middle. Um, so thinking about um, at a law firm, maybe the junior partners or the brand new partners, um, senior associates, people who are kind of moving up in the um, legal ops universe, maybe it's people who are actually doing the work. I think one of the challenges we have a lot of times when we're thinking about rolling out new technologies is that we, um, we don't necessarily think about what exactly we're trying to achieve. We get excited by the technology, we really wanna implement it, and so we just kind of try to chug it in. And it really has to be customized to that firm, to that organization, it really has to be the way they want to use it. If you're creating a brand new process, if you're creating something brand new, there's always more friction there. And so when we start with the middle, we start with the people who know exactly what needs to be done. They know how much work has to be done. They know the quality, the expectations, the outcomes. And so those are the people that are best positioned to give you feedback and say, yes, this will work. No, that won't work. Or, oh, this is a, a big problem. That's a minor problem. Um, you'd be surprised how, especially in a startup, we get lots of feedback and we're very connected to our user community. Um, and sometimes the feedback from the, the junior folks is very useful in certain areas, maybe design areas where we just need to think about ease of use. And the senior folks, the partners, are really useful for getting the backing for that technology, right? So when I think about how does a senior partner kind of help his firm or her firm move forward, Find those really smart people that we know that exist in the middle and back those guys. Listen to them and back them all the way through. Wonderful, my goodness. Dan, when you uh, think about this at, at Northwestern or when you previously practiced, do you have any stories or any anecdotes that you would, you would bring to this to talk about? Yeah, I think there's a, a, a real big obstacle to innovation and technology adoption is that we are not evidence-based in the way we practice law. Okay. So we, we have different ways we do things. We have maybe some norms for the way we do things, but we don't gather evidence, right? Going back to like what something about Cheryl said, like, well, what's our goal? What are we trying to achieve? And then how do we gather evidence about whether we're actually doing that or how we're accomplishing that? And I think that creates problems, for example, even just doing basic tasks. If, if the four of us are lawyers and we're in a firm and we draft, do something simple like draft an NDA or a basic settlement agreement, we can do it four very different ways. And no one's going to say, well, wait, this is the standard. Uh, here's how we're going to measure whether it's effective and what it did for the client. Or, or let's even take a step back and understand and ask, well, what does the client actually need here, right? It's kind of like we approach from the perspective like, oh, well, we're all smart lawyers. We really know. And, and this is the way we do it. Or, and, and maybe we did it. Well, this one time something happened and we do it. But how do we, we change things so we can become more evidence-based and empirical? How do we become... Um, more about science and less about this idea of the art of being the lawyer. Some things are artistry, arguing uh, to the, the jury maybe in closing arguments or, or arguing in front of a judge and figuring out how to adapt. But more and more of this is all about thinking about a scientific approach. And that's why I talk so much about people, process, data, technology, and really focusing on thinking about the people in the process part, process improvement and project management, to really understand, well, how do we do things? Um, you know, there, there are a lot of examples we can draw on from medicine. And over 100 years ago, medicine and law were kind of in the same place. There was like this community of practice and you had norms on the way you did things. But in medicine, they took an empirical turn. And they started really gathering data and they started running randomized controlled trials. And, and they really know, they don't just like have things like you, you go to a doctor and they do heart procedures. It's like, no, they really carefully define things, what's being done. And they have measures of quality and, and what does what effectiveness look like? And we need to do a lot more of that in law so we can better understand best practices for, for how to get things done and how to really start with, again, I go back to the people process, project management process improvement. A lot of people dismiss some of these things, uh, but I look at it like in a framework of Clayton Christensen's sustaining and disruptive innovation. 
And so everyone's really interested in the disruptive innovation, right? You know, your face melting ideas, a lot of them are disruptive innovations, right, Joe? We've got to be thinking about those without a doubt. But at the same time, especially in law, it's like, gee, we're not so good at crawling, okay? So let's talk, we're talking about sprinting in 10 years, but let's, we got to figure out some of these basic things about good uh, process improvement, project management, being more empirical, um, evidence-based, gathering data, and that'll lay the foundation we need for, the, the, that's the sustaining innovation that we need to lay the foundation for disruptive innovation. Oh, you're, I mean, you're so right about that. A lot of this is around innovation and the different capabilities that are out there. So Cheryl, I'm kind of curious, when we think about innovation at uh, any of the organizations you've worked at over the years, you know, what are the common themes or challenges that you've seen uh, inside that people are, like, are always butting their heads up against? Ah, like, how do you break through from some of that? Yeah, so I think the the number one thing I've seen at every firm I've been at, and even the firms I work at uh, work with today, is really the the highly siloed nature of of firms and, and legal departments. And so, I think one of the challenges we have is who owns innovation, right? Is it is it the IT? Is it the CIO? Is there someone who is a chief innovation officer? Is it somebody on the practice side? And I've seen um, lots of areas where those areas come into conflict, and and there becomes problems. People. You know, maybe the IT department buys a piece of technology that the practices don't think is going to be that, that useful. Um, maybe the idea, the business case or the problem hasn't been well defined. And, and when those things sit in, in, in silos and when those groups aren't well integrated, um, everybody makes their own decision and runs with it. And so I think that can be a huge problem um, for, for for especially for large firms. So I think as we move forward, we have to think about um, more kind of teamwork, I think, and, and building teams and building committees that have a nice cross-sectional view of everyone from the business side, legal secretaries, paralegals, everybody has to be at the table when we're bringing innovation forward because all of this affects all of us. Excellent. Colin, what are your thoughts on this from your lens? Yeah, so I, I totally agree with what uh, Dan and, and Cheryl said. I mean, I, I think you know, one thing I've I've seen happen sometimes is, uh, or, or seen as as a problem, I should say, is lawyers have a tendency to be where very inward focused. Uh, they don't tend to be, um, by and large, I should say, with with exceptions, of course, um, focused on listening to those who are not within the profession. And I think that often is to their detriment because there's a lot to be gained from learning from others outside of the profession. For example, you know, the legal industry in medicine, the analogy that Dan was making earlier, I do think that there is a lot that the legal industry can learn from, from medicine in terms of turning towards a more scientific data-driven approach. I mean, something that I like to say is that lawyers should really be regarding data as kind of like gold. Uh, there's a lot of useful information to be gained that you just have to dig for and, and get. For example, in contracts, for example, contracts store so much useful data that is barely made any use of. Usually what happens is a contract is negotiated, it's stored, not really thought of too much until there is a problem. Well, the problem with that is that's a little short-sighted, number one. Number two, it's not very proactive because surely there's an, some clause in there that perhaps you may find useful again going forward. You saw some piece of language in there you like that you want to use again. Or, you know, you keep having to negotiate the same provision all over and over again, and you want to see how many times it's come up and why it's such a problem. Or there are tools that can help you do that. But the problem is a lot of lawyers oftentimes just kind of, they just move on and don't really think too much about those things. And I think that kind of data can be really very useful in providing more strategic value added uh, advice, I should say, in support to the business, uh, where other business functions use data to, you know, for all sorts of different purposes. And legal, for some reason, thinks that they don't necessarily need to because, you know, they're magicians performing magic tricks behind uh, a curtain. Well, I hate to break it to a lot of lawyers, but you're not magicians. Um, you're not performing magic tricks. It may seem magical to your client, and that's great if your client's happy, but ultimately they know in their heart of hearts it's not magic that's that's happening here. So I think we need to kind of get over ourselves as lawyers and, and really take a more evidence scientific approach like along the lines of what Dan was saying. 
I like it, the hard lessons, but <laughs> but I think you're absolutely right on with that. Um, okay, so let's maybe transition to our, our second topic of the day, which is the managing change fatigue and user adoption. But it follows on to some of these words that we've talked about can be very buzzy, but there is clearly something to them. But I think sometimes people get uh, maybe a little complacent or a little tired of it. And one part of this is like, oh, maybe there be, might be an initiative at a firm or organization of, of whatever size around innovation. But these days, how do we manage all of these changes that people have to deal with, plus these buzzy words, what are they supposed to, to lean into or what not? So maybe Cheryl first, like when you think about these things at an organization, how do we avoid these, these the fatigue that people might have around this in terms of adoption of, of these challenges or whatever we might see in this space? Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because I think it really, again, gets back into thinking about silos to some extent, right? So um, when we're thinking about um, big projects, let's say you're doing an iManage rollout and you're bringing on a smart contract and you have all this stuff going on, it's a lot to take in and lawyers are already strapped for time. I mean, everybody's billing way more hours than exists in the day already. And so asking them to dedicate a lot of brain energy to learning new things, changing their processes, is overwhelming and that's reasonable. And so when we think about how we're working inside an organization to bring about change, we have to coordinate that change across the organization. So we can't have the iManage project and the smart contracts project landing three days apart from each other and then asking people to attend sessions over the last five days. That's insanity and it fails. And so um, I think we have to think about kind of what else is going on in other people's lives. And even in some cases, I hate to say it, watch out for Windows Tuesday. Like, maybe don't release anything on Tuesday because Microsoft will be screwing it up for you anyway. So I think we have to just be cognizant of what else is going around um, around us inside the organization that we work within. And then also really kind of empathetic and considerate to the people who the change is impacting. I think sometimes we say, oh, well, this is a minor change. If I told you how many times some technical person has told me it was a minor change and it's such a huge impact where I have attorneys calling me and yelling at me. Um, it's really about, about putting ourselves in the shoes of the users and really trying to see how this is going to impact them. Oh my goodness, I'm glad you brought the empathetic part of it because I think that's so often forgotten about. People are just trying to get things done as quickly as possible, pushing very, very hard on all the individuals, the teams, uh, especially on, on Tuesdays, uh, yeah, to get things done or whatever the case is. So Dan, I'm very curious to hear your perspective about this at the university level and having uh, practiced. What, how are you, how are you molding, melding these, these young minds that are future legal or the hybrid of, of engineering and legal that are starting to come together? What can we learn from them and what you're seeing in this space as well? Yeah, we can learn a lot from the students. I think that's another part of it. And I think there are more and more opportunities for law graduates to be empowered in these organizations. But first we need better leadership in every one of these legal organizations. Uh, so we have to clearly communicate why innovation and technology adoption is important, right? Why is it important? What's in it for the people? Uh, engage with people, listen, exercise that empathy, really understand where people uh, sit, but then empower people. And I don't mean just the lawyers, right? I think too many organizations, the problem is, is that there are only certain people who are empowered. We really need to empower everyone. When I talk about the, the best process improvement exercises I've ever been a part of where I went to a law firm and we had everyone included, marketing department, admins, paralegals, right? And, and just bringing everyone together and communicating well, like this is the goal, here's what we're doing, here's the challenge, right? Let's, and let's map this out and let's talk about how we can do better, how we can provide better service. That takes really strong leadership. And I think in most organizations, that's lacking. There's a handful of law firms now that have been very clear about their mission and vision, what it is they're really trying to accomplish with innovation, with technology adoption. And they're really empowering people to carry that forward, giving them space to, to generate ideas, but then test their ideas. I think that's another problem that we run into frequently, right? It's like the loudest voice in the room comes up with you know the smart idea and that's, oh, well, that's what we're gonna do. And it's like, well, if we're really innovating here, we're, we're brainstorming, we're coming with ideas, we have to test them, we need a little, we need some space so we can learn how to experiment 
and learn from from uh, the innovation. But we need everyone on board. Uh, that's you know th these are some of the things that went through in the pandemic here at Northwestern. There was there was very strong leadership across campus. Uh, we had lots of training opportunities to learn about these things, and we had great engagement by faculty because they understood. Well, this is important. This is what we do. We we deliver world class education. So we're going to show up for these sessions because we see the value that it's going to provide if we do that. I love that idea. I mean, definitely leadership is a, a key component to this, no question. So Colin, I'm kind of curious from your perspective. I know that all three of you uh, do some blogging and clearly lots of talks and engagement with people of all sides and all different groups. But like from maybe from the blogging side, from the sort of the echo chamber that we all may hear probably too much of in terms of adoption, fatigue on certain concepts or idea, ideas, how do we sort of keep that fresh? What's your perspective on that maybe? Sure. Um, before I get to that, I just wanted to give an example of what Dan was talking about in terms of empowering teams, because I think that is such a powerful, uh, powerful thing. When I was uh, sole and ostensible at a company, um, one of the things I had proposed was creating a dashboard where different functions could go to to get access to resources like templates or a frequently asked question um, page that would be dynamically updated. And so I did a bunch of sessions with sales and with other different functions to kind of essentially sell them on the idea of this dashboard in the context of, well, instead of going to me and waiting for me, you don't have to wait for me. You can just go to this dashboard and get the information you need there. And it worked and it was so great to be able to allow them some degree of, give them some power, give them some autonomy, allow them to um, kind of ex exercise, exercise a little bit of leadership with regard to their individual tasks rather than always waiting on me or some other person for these resources. So that's just an example, I think, along the lines of what Dan was talking about with, with the power of empowerment. Uh, with respect to your, your question about, you know, keeping things fresh from a, from a blogging perspective, you know, one of the things I really have focused on a lot with what I do in terms of my blogging is I really intend to shed light on the work that is being done by others because I think it's so important that you are able to hear and learn from folks who are actually taking real steps to act and create things that are meant to help the everyday user or some other uh, demographic needing help from the legal services industry. And I think what often sometimes happens within sort of the echo chambers, you keep hearing and seeing the same things from the same people. And my goal with kind of what I do with my with the platform I have is to try to expand the community and show more folks what others are doing that they may not necessarily hear from, um, but they're able to now hear from thanks to me being able to give them a platform to reach out because they're so focused oftentimes on doing, um, doing the work, which is great, but they also want some record not just some recognition but also some you know they want they want people to know that there are other things going happening in the world other than what they're just seeing within the small little sphere of loud people so that that's kind of what i take that's sort of the approach i should say i take with my blogging uh and i you know i i think that it's been uh reasonably successful in trying to expand the community of people interested and in getting excited about technology and innovation. Yeah, I think that's a, a great approach. I mean, getting people who are tangibly working with something that are practical, they're not saying, oh yeah, this the whole world's gonna change in, in two years around these uh, this Apple glass, <laughs> things like that. But what's really happening and what's, what needs to happen in order to get to whatever stage you're looking for. So now, thank you very much for that. So, all right, let's go to our third topic of the day, which is maintaining business continuity and disaster recovery for cloud and SaaS. It's a big topic and it's something that it's sort of near and dear to my heart as well. I mean, I used to spend a lot of time meeting with um, firms of all sizes. And one of the big topics that I would talk about probably six or seven years ago was cloud. How do you all feel good? How do you all feel about cloud? It might be the CIO of a firm in New York. And typically they'd be like, ah, oh, no, we can't do it. Our clients absolutely say no way, no how, um, because we can't have that data up there. That change and that, that 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 philosophy has changed a little bit over the time, I think. But Colin, I'm kind of curious, um, having practiced in house and of course working in this startup, 
where do you see the landscape right now when we're talking about cloud? And of course, disaster recovery is a major component of that, um, sitting these days within um, various organizations, be it law firms, uh, let's, let's focus on them. Sure, so I, I think that, you know, the cloud, I, I think there's an open acknowledgement of the fact that the cloud is here, it's here to stay, it's um, a useful technology that allows for uh, more flexible ways of working and remote working. Um, however, I also think that there has been a steady um, increase in attention paid to kind of the security around the cloud in terms of how how and where people can access things on the cloud. You know, what type of cloud are we talking about here? We're we talking about a public cloud, we're talking about a private cloud, where are the servers being uh, themselves located? Um, what happens, you know, suppose that the, you know, where we store our stuff on the cloud goes down, how do we get that data back? Um, I, frankly, a lot of the negotiations that I've been a part of, there's been a lot of attention paid to those particular issues, um, given that a lot of businesses um, are SaaS and, and rely um, exclusively on the cloud. So I do think there's a lot of concerns around security. Um, I think there also is, I would say, a um, increased acknowledgement of greater transparency with regards to how the cloud is being specifically used to provision services and allow for access to services as well, because businesses are not just concerned about, you know, where the cloud is, but they're also concerned about, you know, who actually can access it in case of a problem, what level of access do they have, you know, who's looking at my proprietary data, is it a human, is it an algorithm, all those sorts of questions that are coming up more and more, I would say, in the course of uh, everyday business transactions. And there are very few easy answers to, to any of those. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. So, Dan, if I were to say that, um, you know, with all the data breaches that we've seen, with uh, the largest of large law firms getting hacked over the years, and we see this almost every day, organizations of all sizes, be it nonprofits, law firms, corporations, government agencies, universities, everyone is getting hacked at some level. There's something happening in that space. Are, are there any use cases for people not to go to the cloud? Well, I think there's a handful, but right, we can't. The, the problem is we can't have the tail wagging the dog here, which is what's been happening, right? Like there's some, uh, you know, concern about. Well, there's some bank in New York that says you shouldn't be on the cloud, so therefore no one in legal can be on the cloud. And it's like, okay, and, and I think we've gotten away from that, and there's a realization now that they have to be in the cloud. And, and now, particularly with workforces that are more distributed, uh, there are a handful of things, right, that I think that you might want to do. Locally, there might even be some data analytics things that you'd be more uh, cautious about where the data goes and things like that. Uh, but I think those are very few, few and far between use cases. Uh, the cloud is here to stay. And if you're not figuring out ways to, I mean, we need to get the CIOs uh, and the people on the privacy and security teams involved in these conversations early on. And we need to be engaging in responsible innovation and just addressing these things, but we can't allow worries about privacy and security to shut down innovation, which has happened too much in the past, right? So that's, we can solve these problems and the most successful companies on the face of the earth um, and, and governments have solved these problems. Sure, there's problems with hacking. That happens, I don't care where you store your data, right? And, and most failures are human. So it doesn't matter if it's in the cloud or on someone's laptop that they leave on the subway. Uh, so uh, you know, we, can overcome, we can overcome these challenges and we have to keep moving forward with, with technology and, and uh, can't let it get in the way of responsible innovation. It is tough because when you talk to the tech folks at law firms, let's say, I mean, and with respect to them, often their role is to be a bit of a blocker. So as a vendor, I've been through this many times where they say, all right, how about this application? We need every single bit of information we can about where you're storing this, which makes total sense. But it's it's a it's an ordeal to go through, which is an important part of, of making sure things are secure and safe. But sometimes it gets to the point where things are so modified, so locked 
down that it's a no that it's off the chart they can they will not move forward with a, a product or a service because of that um, so we've got to find that balance between the usability the interoperability all of these things that are starting to come together as an important part of the flows that people are moving into within the legal space and Cheryl this is a perfect probably transition to you um, with like the legal platform in this space a lot of it of course is SaaS based cloud-based uh, solutions how how does it look like from your side are you spending a lot of time talking to your customers to your clients about the the struggle of that or is it a, a no-brainer everyone's like yep we're on board that makes sense it's easy easy buy into yeah so i think things have changed quite a bit um i would say it's kind of the pre-march 2020 and the post-march 2020 world in a lot of ways when it comes to cloud and SaaS. so Prior to March, I mean, at all the firms I've been at, it was no cloud, that's insane, we'll never go to the cloud. Some bank in New York said we shouldn't go to the cloud. <laughs> You're exactly right, Dan. Absolutely, I've had those conversations at every firm I'm at, and I'm still having some of those conversations today. But I think there's some things that have evolved, and I, and I do think we're seeing some great signs of progress. So I think, um, I think kind of the first generation problem, maybe five or six years ago with cloud, was a concern about security. Someone else, I don't control the keys, what's going to happen to it. But I think over time, with the development of things like AWS and, and Azure, we have confidence that they have better security experts than we do. And, and to Dan's point exactly, the risk is usually the people, not the system at this point. So I think in a lot of ways, we've kind of mentally gotten over that barrier. But I think where we live now is, in some cases, we're kind of locked into things just because of cost. If you have an on-premise DMS, for instance, Boy, what's it going to cost to move? I talked to a firm the other day. I think they said they were putting a million documents a day in their DMS. Good luck moving that. That's going to be a heavy lift, right? And we don't. The other thing is to think about why are we going to the cloud, right? So you don't go to the cloud to save costs. So if anybody on this is, is thinking that you're going to save money going to the cloud, nope. Lots of other benefits, but that's not the one you should be chasing. So you really have to ask yourself why. So I think in some cases, um, we're seeing people adopt a hybrid approach. So like the tool that I'm working on right now, you can connect an on-premise DMS to a cloud system. And still, that way you still have your data, we don't have it, stay secure where you're comfortable with it, but there's other things that you can leverage that help that become more useful. So I think we will evolve slowly through probably a hybrid in the bigger organizations, but the smaller organizations I think are getting there easily. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. The hybrid seems to be the, the way to go uh, for at least the next several years, maybe into 10 years, but at some point it will probably all be cloud-based. Um, all right, let us go to the third of our topics, which is evaluating the efficacy and value of new emerging technologies. I love this part, so <laughs> let's get into it. So Dan, maybe you first. Um, you did not mention this, I don't believe, unless I misheard it, but I love that you're connected with Codex uh, at Stanford, uh, one of my, my favorite organizations in the legal tech world because it combines so many cool things. And I think back in the day, it was like the engineering school, the law school, the business school, the design school, all these things coming together and saying, okay, how do we come up with some really cool ideas to move industries forward, especially the legal industry, of course. So in that light, and of course, as a professor, um, what are you most excited about in terms of newer technologies that are coming down the road to have an impact on the legal industry? Yeah, well, to me, I think a big part of this, so I want to talk about two different things, and I'll talk again about sustaining and disruptive innovation, maybe is the way I can frame it. I think one of the challenges we have, you mentioned GPT-3 at the beginning of the, the program, and I think one of the problems we have there is uh, I did a, a project with a student, a student who had access to GPT-3, and she wanted to test whether GPT-3 could help with summarizing terms and conditions, right? You go to these websites, it's like 50 pages, right? How could, now it actually did okay doing this, GPT-3. I think there's some challenge with, with GPT-3, just understanding how it works, right? And then and there might be some shortcomings with, I mean, I hear some people saying, oh, it's another step towards artificial general intelligence. I'm not quite that bullish about, I mean, it's an impressive breakthrough and I think it can do some interesting things. But I think the thing that the biggest problem we have in law is that, if I use these tools to create drafts of motions and briefs or generate other documents, how do I know if it's a good document? If Cheryl, Colin, and I all draft a contract, 
whose contract is the better contract, right? We don't, we don't have any standards or baselines for this, and we don't capture data to be able to say even over time, okay, 10 years later, let's look at, right? Or even, okay, how long did it take to get the deal done? How quick did the revenue come in? We don't measure any of these things. So as we create advanced technologies, which I think there's tons of potential, to think about that, even using basic rules-driven conditional logic uh, to, to help people with problems, to generate contracts and things like that, we need to have ways of evaluating, you know, what does good look like? And that's why we've seen machine learning and deep learning explode in these other areas because, you know, going back to, we talk about cat pictures frequently, right? Like these systems would predict, you know, cat or not cat, um, or, you know, Silicon Valley, hot dog, not hot dog, right? Well, there we can be pretty sure we know what the outcome looks like. We can say, hey, that's a hot dog. That's not a hot dog. And the system got it right. It didn't get it right. And we run up against these problems in law where people are like, hey, what I do, it's really special. I really have to exercise this high level judgment and no machine will ever be able to do what I can do. And I look at a lot of areas and I think, actually, I think we can create systems that can really augment and help you do what you do. And I think there are more and more areas where they're to replace components of what we do. Like, I mean, electronic discovery, t technology system review is a great example of that, where we've seen, um, this is a tricky topic because I think a lot of vendors try to avoid this. And I, and I think in some ways, they're, they're a little bit disingenuous about this sometimes, and I think there's a fuller discussion we need to have. Some of these technologies absolutely are going to replace tasks that lawyers do today. And when you replace, start replacing tasks, that could mean there could be fewer lawyer jobs. I don't think that's what the outcome is going to be. I think the world's more and more complex. More and more people need access to justice. We've got so many societal problems to deal with. Let's automate non-disclosure agreements and reviewing documents and doing due diligence and things like that and, and, and figure out ways to use technology for basic contracts so people who have law licenses and, and other people in the legal field can do more to solve big problems in society. Uh, so many things we could jump off into, and <laughs> maybe we will. I want to uh, visit with Colin and Cheryl about the same general concept, uh, the initial question, which is, you know, which emerging technologies are you most excited about, Colin? Yeah, so, well, first of all, I just want to agree with Dan. I think, you know, we have to be realistic about um, technology and where it's going, and it definitely is at the stage now where certain tasks are being replaced by technology but not entire jobs. And quite frankly, I would say to a lawyer, worry about technology coming for your job. If you're worried about the technology coming for your job, you probably should be looking at exactly what you're doing. Because if all you're doing are routine standardizable tasks, well, you're not really providing much value anyway, to be honest with you. So, so that's one thing I think to consider. Uh, more specifically in terms of actual technology that exists that I'm excited about, Ones I'm particularly interested in that I think um, have a lot of potential are tools on the um, sort of litigation side that have to do with litigation prediction, either predicting the outcome of cases or ju judicial behavior or um, how I even was looking at a tool earlier today that could help provide data on how patent examiners have examined patents and, and finding patterns in their examinations. Those are the type of tools that I think can be really powerful in terms of allowing lawyers to make data-driven decisions and provide data-driven advice and counseling to their clients and not just tell a client, yeah, I have a feeling that this is going to go this way or other, but no, I don't have a feeling about this. I'm looking at the data and the data is telling me that this is going to go this way or the other way. A client's going to really be receptive to that as opposed to just a lawyer saying, hey, I'm a good lawyer. I'm probably going to win this because I've just won so many other cases. Really? I, you know, that's just your word. I mean, to, Dan, to Dan's point, I mean, there, you know, the lack of standards is really, I think, in some ways harmful to the clients in terms of figuring out where best to turn for legal services that are most attuned and uh, going to provide the best um, possible outcome for whatever the client is looking for. Now, uh, wonderful, and I think you're you're both dead on about that. I think one of the things that that we're not talking about in this industry enough is that there are tools out there that are sort of nipping at the heels of certain tasks. Uh, if not, they're already there. And so people need to really think about what is that next elevated level where they need to focus maybe their attention on. Uh, so Cheryl, what, what are you thinking about in this space? What, what excites you about emerging technologies that, that may take off in the next several years? 
Yeah, so I think um, I think outcome analytics is really, I think the place where there's so much value to be derived. So I think Colin, you're exactly right. I think um, I think in the very, very near future, there are, go there are going to be firms that can tell clients what the opposing party's success likelihood is, right? So not just about us, but it's about predicting the success depending on who you're going up against in, in litigation. So I think that's something very interesting. I think too, I don't ever think kind of one technology ends up being the thing. I think each firm, each organization has a unique set of business problems or business opportunities to take advantage of. And so it's really about evaluating and valuing the technology based on what you need at that point in time, right? So how do you make money? If getting more efficient doesn't, doesn't make you make more money, then that's not something that you should go chasing products that do that for you. But if you're an AFA firm that does uh, you know, completely flat fee agreements, go get efficiency, right? Um, so I think that there's lots of things that we can, we can focus on, but we really have to start with what is the goal of the firm, right? Or the organization? Are we trying to make money? Are we trying to save money? Are we trying to you know, litigate more cases? Are we trying to write more contracts? What are we trying to do? And chase the technology that meets those needs. It's not the same for everyone in my mind. Not really well said. And I, and I agree with all of you who mentioned uh, analytics. It's clearly a, uh, an area of growth, a ton of growth, as, as we have more data and tools to understand that data to bubble up what, me, what needs to be uh, sort of identified. Makes a ton of sense. All right. I'm kind of curious from a personal perspective because uh, no one mentioned this but i'm i'm going to toss this out on a lark to see what your impressions are of it it's something i spend a lot of time on and a lot of energy probably too much energy on and that's really around sort of the computational contracts the smart contracts the very early days i know and when you were talking about both uh, Colin and Dan about the medical industry and what's going on in that space as a great example, sometimes I lean on the financial industry in the same, same light. And one of the things that I'm seeing them aggressively go after is sort of the smart contracts. So basically, and you all know this, but imagine a contract that's written, that's of course turned into code and the parameters inside of that, that are the only piece that really are contingent that change, be it a time, a date, uh, at the most simplest level, um, the parties that are involved in that, when those things are triggered by an outside source, uh, an Oracle, then something else happens. To me, I think that this is one of the uh, one of the areas that is going to grow immensely, especially on the transactional side, uh, which then will translate into uh, <laughs> the litigation side at some point in time. What are your all What are your thoughts on that particular type of technology over the course of the next five years? Do you think we're still like ah, way far out, ten years away, or do you think it's actually something that's going to take root uh, sooner than people are really uh, thinking about? Um, maybe. Dan, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think that, I mean, you mentioned finance, right? And we're seeing more and more examples of where, where things like that are happening. I think there are more and more companies and organizations. To me, again, you need standardization to be able to do this, right? And so as people are, are doing more with document automation and then they're using data analytics more, I think all of that is driving us towards more standardization. And, you know, it's like in my prior career, interestingly enough, I worked in, in transportation and shipping and we used electronic data interchange. And we had very, like we had all these fields mapped out and, and I mean, it's kind of uh, more like XML versions of later on when I was practicing. Right, so we've got, you know, people are talking about using markdown language for contracts. There's several, we've had a couple projects in our uh, innovation lab at Northwestern, including with, with Common Accord and Jim Hazard. So there are a lot of people working on these problems. There's more and more research. I think there's some really interesting research going on in universities. You mentioned Codex before, we're doing some things here at Northwestern. Uh, in Europe, people are working on this. So I think we're seeing a lot of people pushing on some of these ideas that are helping to make it happen. I mean, widespread adoption of some of these different ideas might be, uh, might be longer away, but I think, you know, it's, it's, I see it percolating in more and more places in this idea that we wouldn't write contracts as bespoke contracts and we would try to use standards and tools and, and make things people like these, this idea, right, that we have to use machine learning to look at a corpus of contracts afterwards to try to figure out what's there, right? In natural language processing, like why don't we just actually write the contracts in a way that we understand what's there from the beginning without having to reverse engineer at the back end? So there are a lot of things pushing in this direction. Wow, that, 
that's so key what you just said at the end. I, that's the part that I've been, I guess, leaning into more. I know Codex is working on that sort of space, which uh, is going to be fantastic to watch. Uh, Cheryl and Colin, any, any thoughts or philosophies on this by chance you want to share? Yeah, so I think I think Dan hit on a lot of really great points, but I think the thing that I've seen a lot of firms miss is the difference between kind of raw data and information, right? Things that are usable and things that aren't usable. Um, we had done some work where we were working with um, uh, Georgia Tech and kind of said, hey, look at all this. What can you do with this? And they said, that's a pile of garbage. We can't do anything with it. Um, and, the, and the problem gets exactly to the problem that you're talking about, Dan, which is consistency, standardization, and normalization. And so we have to kind of put the same fields in the same place, format them the same ways in order for that information to become useful. And so I think that's something that maybe isn't necessarily in our nature and the thing that we're used to doing, and that might be a change we have to absorb as an industry, but it's really about thinking about how am I going to use this piece of information, whether it's a contract or the parties, or how am I going to save all these fields? We really need to be thinking about how they'll be used by future us, and then hook up future us and do something good for yourself in the future. I like that, future us. No, that's, that's a great way of envisioning it. Uh, Colin, anything that you wanted to mention? Uh, well, the only thing I, I would add is, I'm, and certainly I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with Dan and, and Cheryl about the need for standardization and normalization. I also think there's a need to kind of understand something that Cheryl pointed out, which is the difference between just kind of what one could call unstructured data and structured data. And the fact that, you know, you have a contract, okay, you got an outline, you got, you know, all these terms in there. Well, not everyone is using those same terms the same way. So the fact that you have one contract that allegedly is about the same thing as, some, as another contract, who is to say whether it really is or not? You have to look look at it completely, you know, carefully and understand. And so, really, you know, I think if we're talking about smart contracts and moving towards um, sort of a common understanding and way of doing something every single time the same way we have to start from the same place and and i mean we're all kind of essentially talking about the same thing which is this need really i think for the legal industry to kind of get a hold of itself and give itself standards under which to operate um that are specific and that are accepted by everyone because you've got other industries that are able to do this. The financial services industry, the only reason why they're able to operate with so much technology automation is because everyone's operating by the same rules. Um, and here in the legal industry, we have, it's not that way. We have all these different, well, at least in the US, you know, every state is doing things differently. And then you can talk about geographic jurisdictions as well that are all doing things differently. You know, you have to kind of clean all that up first before you can really get to any kind of constructed, consistent place to work from. I could not agree with you more. And each and every one of you, actually, I mean, the standards are, are so key, especially in this space. Uh, I'm part of the ILTA blockchain group that's working on conceptualizing this now. It's very early days, but it's, it's coming, hopefully. So we'll see how that goes. All right, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, this has gone exceedingly fast, uh, faster than I ever would have imagined. It's been great. So if we can wrap up here and I'd love to hear maybe a key takeaway from each one of you um, about just something that you think is important people should walk away with uh, from this. Maybe Cheryl first, then Dan, then Colin. And if you could try to keep it to like 30 seconds or a minute if possible, that'd be wonderful. Absolutely. So I think if I were gonna leave you with one takeaway, I would encourage everyone to keep expanding their mental toolkit of what's available, right? So there's tools that you don't need today but you may need tomorrow. And so one of the things I used to do was take a vendor demo every single Friday, spend a half an hour or 45 minutes and see what's out there. Because what, will you, what you'll find is that one day when you need that technology two weeks or two years from now, you can kind of shuffle through your mental toolkit and say, oh, I'll call these folks or I think this will work. Um, so, so help yourself by kind of staying abreast of what's going on. Wonderful. Dan, any last thoughts? Sure, I would just say strategic, having a strategy and, and needing leadership is more important than ever, right? You really need to ask, well, what is our, what's our mission? What's our vision for our organization? And then on an individual level, I'd encourage uh, people to think about tools like the Lean Canvas, which ask you to think about like, who's my customer? 
What's their problem? Like, how do I solve those problems? Uh, what's my unique value proposition? What's my unfair advantage? Like, really rethinking service delivery. I think I heard strategy. <laughs> no, thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, any last thoughts? Uh, my, my last thought, I think, can be summed up this way, which is, to always be learning, always be aware of what's going on in the world. You don't have to be an expert, but you should have some degree of awareness. And most importantly, have an awareness of what business is doing, the direction that business is going in, particularly those businesses which are your customers. I think that's probably the most important thing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And to each one of you, Cheryl, Dan, Colin, for your incredible insights. I mean, I learned a ton. And I also want to thank, of course, our producer, Alec Moore, as well as our partner, Ilta. Thank each and every one of you for joining and listening today. I am Joe Rosinski, bidding you all a great day and hopefully happy and healthy times ahead. So thank you very much. Take care.